Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm William Dennis, I'm a product manager on Google Kubernetes Engine, and I'm joined today with, by Alexis. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alexis Richardson. Is this too loud? I'm the CEO of Weaveworks, and I'm also the chair of the TOC for the CNCF, which is the home of Kubernetes and other projects. I've been working on the uh, Kubernetes conformance, if you saw that uh, yesterday in the keynote. Yes, we love Kubernetes conformance. Okay, so we're going to talk today about how to go faster using modern practices, which are, of course, variations on older practices. Uh, and we call this GitOps, to kind of get across the concept that you're driving operations from Git. And I'm going to give you an example to go first. This is a company called Cordoba, which uses our products. And they have a team of, I think, 15 or 20 people. And they are based in San Francisco. They have a website that does internationalization and um, localization. Thank you. And they run all this on Kubernetes Engine and Cloud Builder with Weave Cloud. This is a chart they asked us to share showing their productivity measured in Jira issues and other metrics they use. The, the lower line is where they were before they started using uh, Weave and GitOps, which we're talking about today. And as you can see, the productivity essentially doubled and they went all in uh, not long after that, and it steepened after this. And this is because they managed to go from deployment once or twice a week, driven by Jenkins CI, to automated deployments on Google Cloud using Weave deployment, which we'll talk about today. And this enabled them to do things like reduce the time it took to respond to customers by essentially going about twice as fast, and to reduce the time it took to fix bugs. So if you think about it, when you start to deploy more than once a day, you get a feeling of empowerment and control. You're no longer doing things manually, watching things break, having to fix them. You're actually moving with confidence, and you stop worrying. I asked them, you know, what's the real benefit here? Developers stop having to think about this stuff. It frees up our minds to concentrate on our business that we want to spend real developer time on. And theirs is based on things like machine learning. So machine learning developers want to machine learn. They don't want to deploy. So I think these numbers are pretty, pretty compelling in terms of the change. And actually, it turns out that although we gave them a tool, it's a pattern. And you can do this in lots of different ways. And that's really what we're going to be talking about in this talk. And if you use this pattern right, you too can go twice as fast by doing many more deployments per day. So this pattern is called GitOps, which builds on DevOps practices. And at the core of this is the idea that Git is a single source of truth for your whole system. This is a really profound statement. It's not, not been easy to do this until fairly recently, because we've lacked enough declarative infrastructure that allows us to describe our whole system and then store it in Git. But taken to this extreme, once you've got the whole system described in Git, you can make all your changes to your running system through Git, which essentially means you no longer use things like kubectl, but you start making pull requests instead. And that has the additional benefit that any developer who understands how to do a pull request can also make operational changes, which lowers the cost of entry, which is amazing. Plus, Git is an amazing tool for working in teams. You get an audit trail, you get comments, you can see why people did things, you can go back and forward in time. You shouldn't be rolling your own stuff here. You should be using a tool that works. And we found it, we use it ourselves inside Weaveworks to run our own systems. <clears throat> we could do things like blow up our entire system and recover in minutes just by using this technique. So we'll talk about how that happened. But just to remind you, a lot of what we're showing you is an evolution of what people already do and have been calling GitOps for nearly 10 years. And here's a chart I found on the internet, a woman called Helen, um, who's a consultancy specializing in DevOps, really showing the evolution in stages. And it's a tiny bit each year. And I think GitOps and Kubernetes coming together represent the latest iter iteration of this. And I hopefully we'll see more in the future with things like declarative apps and so on. And I thought Brendan's talk on MetaParticle would fit in quite, quite nicely into this world too. And I mentioned declarative infrastructure, but just to be clear, for those of you who are not sure what this is, here's a YAML. 
one of my favorite things in the world of Kubernetes, YAMLs. It's almost like, uh, you know, if you, you're outside the club until you've figured out what the YAML is. <laughs> so this is a, con a config description of the um, Kubernetes app here. And the key point is that it's a set of statements that you can verify. And you can use it to reproduce a system from that set of statements. It's different from a set of instructions. So we use declarative infrastructure up the wazoo, Kubernetes, Docker, Terraform, Ansible, and our entire system in WeaveCloud, which is a SaaS product, uh, stores monitoring rules, config, dashboards, and the code all together in Git with the full audit trail around it that developers can, can track. And then we can observe our running system and compare it with what's written down in Git. And we have diff tools which alert us when we see when differences occur that are not picked up by the Kubernetes orchestrator. We have an Ansible diff, a Terra diff, a Cube diff, and all of these things fire alerts and tell us when something is happening. And then we can converge from there. So the original DevOps concept was version control your config. We're extending that by version controlling everything. And Kubernetes lets us do that because it's such a rich system with so much that you can declare. So just to recap, Git is a source of truth for the whole system. You can observe the, run, the, the running system, which is different potentially from the desired state. If it is different, you need to be told, because that might be something you need to fix. And when you do want to force convergence, you can make a pull request. Or sometimes the Kubernetes will pick it up for you and orchestrate it away, but sometimes it won't. And we respond to anything from small changes to full-on crises this way. And it means that anyone can come into our team and be productive very, very fast if they know Git. And I believe that a developer pretty much today means somebody who can merge a pull request in Git. So I'm going to hand over to William in a minute. We're going to talk next about the three pillars of GitOps and try and go a little bit deeper into the fundamentals and then come back up again at the end. So the pillars are pipelines, observability, and the counterpart of observability is control. Observability, controllability go together. As you see things, you can fix them. On pipelines, this is an area where there's some confusion. The key point about automating your deployments is everything has to be joined up. And that can mean, that usually means build and deployment and release automation. With Git as the desired source of truth. That is what a joined up pipeline is. William, do you want to take over? Sure. So let's talk about how we actually join up these components into a pipeline. Basically, the deployments are actually controlled using the operator pattern. So you've probably seen this pattern a lot in Kubernetes. The operator is what takes the desired state that you declare and give Kubernetes and turn it into the state that it can then observe. So one common example is the uh, deployment object in Kubernetes. You will declare that I have a container and I want to have 100 replicas of that container. That's the declared state. The operator is then responsible of driving the observed state in the cluster towards that state that you gave it. So if there was only one, and you, and you said it should be 100, it's responsible for making that true. Equally, if you're sound asleep, and you know, a bunch of nodes disappear, and, and that uh, replica count drops down, the, uh, the observed state is now not equal to your declared state, and so the operator is then driving that back up. So with GitOps, we have actually applied the same pattern used throughout Kubernetes to actually drive your entire config from Git uh, to be the, the observed state in the cluster. So basically, to, get, to make this work, everything has to be um, in Git. All the config should be treated like, just like code, right? And anything that is not recording those changes in GitHub is, a, is effectively harmful to the system, because the operator is driving the observed state towards what you've described. If people are tweaking that, in a way that you haven't actually put in Git and that you haven't actually described, it's not going to work very well. 
What happens though if you are starting not from a clean slate? Like you already have a running cluster with and it's working just fine. So to get into this sort of happy path, you need to have all your config under Git management. But you don't have that. So what do you do? Well, fortunately, kube, kube control has this uh, uh, export flag in kube control get. And you can just go through one by one all your resources and extract, extract that out of the cluster. Be careful though with export because it, it's intentionally dropping some of the fields from the declarative config. And these are fields that it thinks are not required. So things like the node IP address, which is generally not used, um, it will drop that. But sometimes it gets it wrong, sometimes it drops too much, sometimes it misses something. So as you kind of do this uh, export from the cluster, make sure you're reviewing the, the content. What about secrets, though? So we're saying that everything should be in Git. Every single change should be stored in Git. But of course, secrets are not very good to keep in Git, right? Because um, they're then visible to people that, that maybe they shouldn't be visible to. Well, Binami have a pretty cool solution for this. So it's called Sealed Secrets. You can search it on GitHub. Um, it's open source. And what it does is it provisions a private key into the cluster and then provides a public key that the developers can use to encrypt the secrets. So they can encrypt those secrets and then store them in Git, just like any other configuration. It then actually uses the same operator pattern, so it has its own operator that is then looking at these, in, these encrypted uh, secrets and decrypting them with its private key. So what that means is that if you want to take this cluster and recreate it, like we were talking before about uh, disaster recovery, um, and disaster recovery is actually a good kind of litmus test of whether you've declared everything correctly, because if it doesn't come back up, then you probably haven't declared it well. Um, <laughs> so when you create that new cluster, you bootstrap it with that one private key, uh, and then all the other secrets come in. And it just means that you can, you can manage all the other secrets through the, the GitOps uh, workflow. Really cool, really cool project. All right, so what, is this, what does it actually look like? What does the uh, GitOps repository look like? Um, so here I'm referring to the config repository. This is a separate repository uh, for your code. And the reason we keep it separate is that you likely have some continuous integration triggering on the code, and you don't want changes to the config triggering an image, because that kind of gets a bit weird. Um, so we tend to recommend one repository per kind of logical application or service. And what I mean by this is, is anything that, that is sort of tightly coupled together. So um, could be a bunch of deployments, a bunch of services, any other Kubernetes resources that sort of that are a part of like one output typically of like a team uh, with their own like backwards, forwards, compatibility guarantees and whatever. Then what you can do is use a separate branch for each environment. So you know, let's say you might have three, staging, production, and test. Um, you probably have more. But the idea is that you have one branch per environment. And these branches map to a Kubernetes namespace or a completely standalone Kubernetes cluster. And the reason we use the namespace or a cluster is so that you can reuse the same objects uh, from staging to production. So if you have a deployment that's called foo, you, you don't want to have like foo-staging and foo-prod. It's much simpler just to call it foo, um, or, and, and safer to be honest, uh, and deploy that into a separate uh, namespace or cluster. So a common pattern we see is someone will have a production cluster and then maybe a test cluster with, with a bunch of different environments. So then the process is any changes that you want to make you first make them in GitHub. So a very common change would be you're bumping the version of an image, right? You've just released some code. But there are lots of other changes that, that should go through this as well. In fact, all changes should go through this way. But things like health checks, changes to the replica accounts, uh, things like that should all go through this Git process, where you would do a pull request, submit it to, say, the staging or a feature branch, get that peer reviewed, submitted, tested, and then when it's ready, to roll it out to production, you basically just merge that change from the staging branch to the production branch. Now, the benefit of doing it this way is that even though you're, you're getting code review on this final merge, you've already tested that exact configuration in staging. So let's say you might have like fat fingered and, and mistyped the number of replicas, for example. Uh, maybe you missed a zero. You don't want to take down the system. Or maybe you added a zero and you're about to run up a really big bill. Um, all, all these kind of things, or, or you have a health check. That, that's, this is a really good one. If, if your health check is buggy, then it's going to be declared unhealthy, right? And what happens if everything is declared unhealthy? The whole system goes down. So that's why you want to um, deploy these changes first to staging. And then rolling it out should just be a merge. And at that point, you should know that the, the um, changes are fairly safe. Of course, there is one catch here. Um, 
And that is what happens if you have staging only changes. Um, so at the very beginning, as you're setting this up, or, or perhaps you know, throughout the life cycle, you may need to make changes to staging. In that case, it's a little bit tricky. There's, I don't think there's a really good analogy here, but you just have to make the changes in the staging branch, and you can use this git merge dash s ours strategy to effectively say that you have merged the change without actually applying the change. Uh, it just means that the next time someone does a merge, it's not going to pull in that change that was meant to be staging only. Finally, um, definitely use uh, features like protected branches to, to ensure that all those code reviews are enforced on the production branch. All right, so this is uh, what the pipeline looks like. And I kind of wish I had a laser pointer here, but um, effectively, the, the top pipeline is your typical kind of CI pipeline. Um, the developer commits a change, goes in the Git repository for the code, the container builder kicks in, builds that image, uploads it to a container registry. Then we have the, uh, an extra step at the end. Now, Alexis talks a lot about this, but a lot of people basically at this point just jam in their continuous deployment. Um, it's not so great doing it that way. What, what we do with GitOps instead is, is rather than um, deploying that change, we, we um, edit the staging configuration and change the image to be the one that was just created. So here you have like an automatic push to staging effectively. Once the, and that's that config up data at the end there. Once that change has been committed into Git, the operator, the deploy operator that I mentioned earlier, kicks in and notices, oh wait a minute, the observe state in Git is now different. Um, so the observe state in the cluster is now different to the desired state in Git and will deploy that uh, staging change automatically. Um, typically, prod isn't set up on the same kind of automatic push. So then um, you have an operator here, uh, user two at the bottom, doing that merge from staging to production. Uh, it goes through code review. Uh, and once it's accepted, uh, it goes into the git config in the production branch, at which time the deployment operator for the production cluster will kick in and do the same rollout. And Alexis, back to you. Thank you. So <coughs> you forgot one thing. Yes. I believe that the operator has a name. All right. <laughs> so it just so happens that uh, Weaveworks actually has an open source deployment operator called Weaveflux, um, which you can deploy into your cluster. Um, that, that completely follows that pattern. Yeah. And I guess your cloud product uh, has that yeah. too. You can see the GUI on our booth, but the, the open source piece is Weaveflux. Um, take a look, uh, read about it. It's pretty cool. It's Inspired by the same sort of motivations that Diane described yesterday when she talked about Spinnaker, but it's Kubernetes native, as, as I think William has made it very clear that that's quite important. So I'll say a few words about the other two pillars, and we'll wrap up and have some questions. Um, observability, which I think has been in, on Twitter a lot recently, in its simplest, it's the property of a system that it is observable. Um, but it's also kind of shorthand for getting your monitoring, logging, tracing, and visualization right. And making sure that if things go wrong, you can dig into your system and understand what's going on. If your system is not observable, you will not be able to find out what is wrong when something does go wrong. And that is actually a big problem. And the more complex the system, the more of a problem that will be for you. Because we're talking about deployment, though, what is observability-driven deployment? This is a gentleman, a guy called John Arundel in the UK who came up with a really neat description of this, which boils down to don't accept the pull request in that last stage if you don't have a way to check that what's happened is the right thing. And if it's gone wrong, be able to take action to remedy it. So observability is essentially tied to GitOps because it's the property of a system that you can check that your pull requests are happening correctly or incorrectly. At a service level, meaning anything from user experience, which is the most important thing if, if you have users, down to deep diagnostics. So you've got to integrate your GitOps pipeline with your tools to observe things, which means if you do a service push, you want to see the error rate on your service, for example, as it's happening. And the more that you adopt policies like canaries, stage deployments, the more important it becomes to see the stages impact on the system uh, early so that you can make the right decisions. And this is how you gain confidence in your system and ultimately how you get to go faster and faster to having many deployments a day. So it's also the ability to think in terms of holistic 
being like a doctor. Is my system happy? Is it about to become unhappy? Is something looking, smelling wrong? Because you really want to stop problems happening before they become real issues. And then, of course, obviously fixing them if, if they are. So we're starting to see companies like, this is from Lyft. Matt Klein, the, the author of Envoy, has been showing this, this chart. It's a concept of a dashboard that un unites elements of observability together. Um, metrics like error rates, request rates, uh, latency bars with events, like a deployment has just occurred. The canary went from 50% to 70%, which means that somebody can focus on the service's health as the deployment is occurring. And as this is a short talk, we won't go too deep, but there are blogs about this that you could read. And control is the counterpart of observability. And it basically goes back to that principle of GitOps, which is do things through Git to make sure that you've got a consistent and correct running system relative to your desired state. Meaning if you change your desired state in Git, then of course your system must be updated as well, rather than messing around with kubectl if you can avoid it. And the more things that we figure out how to describe using those good old YAMLs, the better. So things like security policy, application policy, um, monitoring, other properties. And then good old orchestration is a model of control. What Kubernetes is actually doing for you and other orchestrators like Swarm is correcting the running state relative to the desired state for you. And diff and sync we mentioned a few times. These are somewhat crude but important tools for alerting you when something is actually different between the observed state and the desired state so that you can, can fix it. And convergence is the way you do that. So this is a picture of this. Desired state, observed state. Desired state, observed state. So control means convergence. And here's a picture of that diff tool firing. Something is wrong in Kubernetes. Some, some examples. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have a habit of blowing up our entire system. That's a total wipeout, but we can recover from Git. There's also lots of sort of smaller things, like I'm changing the property of a service, changing a policy on a service. And having mentioned services a few times, I wanted to just emphasize that this implies a certain life cycle. So if you want to know what you're doing, this is a picture of it. You start in Git, you go to Kubernetes, and then you use your monitoring and tracing tools to see what's going on, to construct observed state. And then you have a control loop to finish it off, which may update Git. So there you go. That is what operations is in the Kubernetes world, in the GitOps world. And for those of you who are fond, like I am, of acronyms, there's a famous acronym called OODA, which came up in the 60s, Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. And it's been used to describe many things. It was used by uh, Coda Hale, uh, famously about seven or eight years ago, to describe how Yammer, so it was, yes, it was Yammer, do their operations. So inspired by that, I've called this the RUDA loop, because it's release-driven. Release, observe, orient, decide, and act. So that's your life cycle. And so at the risk of being cheesy, as an ex-mathematician, here's a fundamental theorem of GitOps, the, the core of it. Only what can be described and observed can be automated and controlled and accelerated. And that is what Kubernetes really incarnates for you. And all of the other tools that we'll see in Cloud Native should do this. So William, back to you. Right. So j just to summarize, the three core principles of GitOps uh, that you can hopefully take away. Um, and if you're on Twitter, by the way, we've got the GitOps hashtag, so a bunch of this uh, content is already up there. Um, but the three core principles are use declarative config to define your application and the services. All changes need to go through a Git review process. No one should be using um, kube control directly. So that means even if you have a, a production emergency, don't be using kube control. You should just be using like git push force or something, right? So everything should still be going through git. Um, and finally, use an operator in the cluster to, to drive the observed cluster state to the desired state as declared by that same configuration in git. Last but not least, GitOps is for developers. We, I believe, maybe you believe this too, that more and more people will have the job title of developer in the future relative to operations. And that doesn't mean those things are going to go away. It just means that 
the way that we deal with systems is going to look more like how developers think and do things. As we, as we get closer and closer and closer to you know, the dream presented, e.g. by uh, Brendan yesterday, of something that's so simple that a, a, a young person could come in and build a sophisticated app really in very little time. And, and GitOps is just taking that to its logical conclusion for operations using cloud native tools. Cool, okay, so do you, do you want to ask us some, some questions? So we have a mic uh, in the middle there if, uh, if you have any questions. Um, we also have preceded a couple um, which we can chat about. Hey, uh, awesome, I really like uh, this whole thing. Um, and I think the devil is in the details, I guess, with this. Um, it really makes sense for Kubernetes deployments, but when we talk about other things like, like different things like uh, dashboards and Kubernetes and like console configs and all these different things, like do you end up writing your own operators that can read what's happening and then diff it and then, and then apply it to production? Yes. So that's first question. And second question is, there's gotta be some stuff in your stack that you're not doing this with. What is it and why? Shall I say that? Please. So I can describe a real system which is Weave Cloud, um, which is a relatively um, complete interpretation of the GitOps idea. Um, so we have three tools that I mentioned, Kubediff, Ansible Diff, and Teradiff. Ansible Diff is just a wrapper around Ansible's own diff capability. Teradiff is something which uh, tells you when Terraform is out of sync, and we provision on Amazon using Terraform. We find that to be very effective. Um, and Kubediff is the one I showed you an example of. Uh, the one that we don't have yet described is the app itself. And I think that's kind of next. So there is a SIG. Um, called, uh, it's called AppDef, the AppDef SIG. And we would very much like people who care about declarative definitions of applications to be part of that. So please. So it's like get more involved. than just the deployment, it's, it's kind of everything related to everything that. Everything that sits on top of Kubernetes, yeah. Right. I, I think for me, the one thing that I, I hadn't used it really with was secrets. Um, I actually found out yesterday that Binami had that really cool sealed secret tool. So, um, but it's good that there's a solution now. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about sort of the multi-branch strategy and actually things diverging. Right. In the Terraform world, there's a tool, the wrapper called Terragrunt, basically delegates to Terraform and you just define the variables. In other words, just the different configurations for the different environments. So how do you manage in this thing that I don't actually have all these different YAML files and complete chaos versus I have a single source of truth for I want to deploy this and just make these changes in each right. environment. So I think, I think that would be one way to do it. Um, I think I probably meant to say on that slide that this was just kind of like one example of like, like how I've done it. Um, so I guess you can store everything as config, file, uh, as config and, then, and then you just don't change the YAML at all. So uh, maybe like, a config map would be what you a, would use. A config use map for, for the image and the replicas and things like that, yeah. I got you. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think. I think we're not super opinionated on the exact implementation. It's kind of like the, just the, yeah, the best practice. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, what's the um, conditions that cause diff in the environment? Uh, like what's the, you know, uh, triggers that cause, cause diff? Because you wouldn't expect that. And then the second thing is, do you use releases at all in, in your uh, Git workflow? Or is it just bran specific branches? I don't think we're using Git releases. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of some good examples. I mean, there are, there are things that Kubernetes is not aware of, like machines going away, which might be picked up sooner um, with the cube diff. We have a range of different alerts. Um, yeah, simulator, and I'll put you in touch with engineers and I'll give you all of them if you like. Yeah, I mean, so basically it's, it's events that are out of your control. Yeah. That, okay. That's right, so I mean, <clears throat> I guess one example could be someone applied a manual change. Um, that, that's the sort of situation, like, what, what do you do, right? It, it, with the true operator pattern, you would actually just blow away that change immediately. Um, but I think you might have had a, a situation where we will actually, the deployment operator will observe the fact that someone modified the cluster manually and put an alert through on Slack or something. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of classic, is you've got somebody, I mentioned it several times, it's great when new people join the team and it's really easy and simple, but actually also new people can join the team and do something which is unintended. Um, and those, that's the kind of thing that will get picked up by one of these diff tools quite, quite often. Or somebody yeah. goes out to lunch and doesn't, someone else comes in and doesn't realize that something has changed. But I think from my perspective, like I would, I would take a fairly, I would basically say whatever's in Git should be deployed. Mm -hmm. And if someone tweaks it manually, which they really shouldn't be doing, um, it would just get blown away. Well, that's what happens. I mean, that, it, right. in, in, it, if you use WeFlux, it will do that to you. Yeah. And actually, one thing to add about this, uh, this GitOps flow, I think, is that it's really nice how like, every commit is, is like an atomic commit. 
um, and every every change like can be rolled back straight away. So sometimes an application like until we have this like app def thing, an application might consist of many different configuration files, and even though some of the Kubernetes objects like deployment have their own history. Uh, it's not necessarily related to everything else. So while you can roll back a deployment, can you roll back the associated change that you made to the service? The answer is no. But with GitOps, you can just roll back effectively the commit. You can literally do a Git rollback, um, and, it, and it'll undo all of the changes. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's one thing I, I meant to mention. When I said at the beginning, making Git the desired source of truth, or the source of truth for your desired state is profound. It's because of things like that. It's really important. It's kind of like comparing like the old like CVS approach to, to Git, whereas yeah. in CVS you had like version history but on a per file basis, and with Git you get it across the entire repo. And you can um, see who did what and what, who was around, and yeah. you can use Git rules for security as well. Right. So Cordoba, who we mentioned at the beginning, have discovered that their Sarbox compliance is now done through looking at the audit trail of the changes they made to the system, which is all recorded in Git, which is great. Right, so it helps them for compliance. And, yes. Yeah. Next question. Yeah, awesome talk. Um, I get the kind of Kubernetes side and the life cycle of everything on top of that. Obviously, lower down in the stack, things aren't quite as you know tidy. nicely tidy. Um, what's your experience with that, and kind of what's your update strategy for kind of in-place Kubernetes upgrades? Like, are you do you have two environments that you swap over? Like, because right. obviously there's some stuff there that just can't happen as nicely as a, a cube deployment with a canary. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I think, well, one advantage of having everything declaratively defined and stored in Git is that it should be easy to spin up a, a new cluster and, and, and try that out with the new version of Kubernetes. Yep. So I think that's one benefit you get. I think you're right that, that we're not actually solving that yet, um, and that's a problem. So there's um, still some work to be done on the kind of new Kubernetes up, test applications, right. reroute traffic, and um, things like that. Yeah. I, I you, wish there was a better solution for, for the cluster upgrade. But If you go to the website, if you do a Google search for GitOps, you'll find some blog posts which refer to an explanation of how WeaveWorks, Weave Cloud solves that specific problem awesome. in detail. Okay. But it's, it's, it's not something I would necessarily recommend everybody adopt. I mean, it's, it's a system that we built for ourselves. If you want something that's more like product um, that everyone can use and works the same way, et cetera, the good news is that things like KubeADM and, and the tools around it like COPS are starting to bring these capabilities in so you can have idempotent updates and things like that. Cool, thank you. Quick second question. Um, do you have any checks anywhere in this stack for you know, people or new staff accidentally putting like latest instead of a specific image for a Kubernetes deployment or something? Because obviously that isn't potentially gonna stay the same depending on the maintainer and you don't have any control over that. Very good point. Um, I, I guess that should be, you could maybe have that as a, as a part of the pull request uh, if you had like a bot or something reviewing um, kind of. The other one is the signatures. So an obvious extension of the diagram that William showed would be a step to check that an image is signed by consulting a service like, is it called Graphias? Right. Or, or Notary from Docker, which is in the CNCF now. Makes sense. Thanks. But yeah, that, that's actually an excellent point. Like anything that, that is like a work around this Git thing is, is dangerous, whether it's a latest tag or, or wh whether your Docker image is like pulling down, like I, I heard someone was like pulling down a war file, right? Like, <laughs> as it's booting. So anything like that just breaks the model, I guess. Yeah. Hey, so you talked about metrics and you talked about pull requests. So have you seen like pull, um, tying in metrics in validating the pull requests or do they just happen completely unrelated to each other? So you do have something for this, right? Yeah, we've got some examples on our booth actually that you can go and have a look at. Um, we okay. don't study metrics of the development process though. Right. Um, CloudBeats have some nice examples of that at, the, at their booth. Okay, cheers. Great. Well, I think we're pretty much on time. Uh, one last quick one. question. Um, yeah, so what's the reasoning behind having two Git, uh, one for the app and one for right. the config? So, ag again, this is kind of just our opinion. Um, but because the continuous integration typically gets triggered off a commit, uh, what you don't want is to have like a code change which triggers CI, which then updates the config of the staging, which might like trigger another CI, or you have to, you have to make sure that wouldn't happen, and you can kind of get in, like a weird loop, or you, or you have like someone just changing config that then rebuilds the, the image unnecessarily. Um, so I think you can get it to work that way, um, but yeah, maybe there are some reasons uh, to do it. Yeah, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a hard and fast rule, I guess. Okay, so the, the YAML files just live in the config, so if I want right. to change the replicas, 
I cannot do it in the app. It, it would be in the config repository. Okay. Um, with with the way we've set it up, but you know, of course, if if you if you have a better approach, by all means. Um, okay. But I think, yeah, I guess in my head, like I could never get around the fact that I don't want the replica set change to actually trigger an image rebuild of the code. Um, I mean, I, I guess you can do that and then just sort of throw away the image. It's not you know, the image is not actually changing because the code didn't change inside it. Um, but yeah. I think we're out of time. That, that was kind of why we set it up that way. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.